This is our third in a series of videos on sizing sawn wood beams. These are beams that are basically solid wood cut out of a tree trunk. We're going to follow the procedures in the allowed stress design method. As we indicated earlier, this seems to be the method embraced by the wood industry. They put out their design manual every year and it may have 50 pages of information on the allowed stress design and then on the last page it invites anyone who wants to to regenerate the manual in the LRFD form and uh, this has happened multiple times so I'm basically going to embrace the wood industry's um, preference for the allowable stress design as opposed to the load reduction factor design. So again the load reduction factor design was included in the original textbook uh, but because the industry is persistent in not wanting that method, we're going to go with the allowed stress design. All this means is that we're not going to have to include load factors, but they're going to give tables for us uh, allowable stress design for different species and grades of wood, and we will design according to those. Now, in a previous video, we developed some equations for characterizing the behavior of the beam under shear, moment, and relative to deflection. And we came up with these formulas that the shear stress is 1.5 times the shear force divided by the cross-sectional area. Uh, the average shear stress would just be V over A. Um, but because it's, the shear stress is not uniform over the cross section or uniform over the beam, uh, we have a factor of 1.5 that describes how much larger the largest shear stress is compared to the average shear stress. And of course, the worst shear is for a simple span beam is at one or the other end of the beam. Um, so in evaluating this equation, we go find the worst case scenario because we have to design for shear anywhere in that beam and therefore we're looking for the worst shear to make sure that we make the beam strong enough for that. Um, we also have talked about what planes wood is weak on and wood shears more easily parallel to the grain than across the grain. We all know this. This is why if we want to split a log we turn it up on end and we come down on the end of it so that we're tearing grain apart, that occurs much more easily than trying to cut across the grain. And the same is true for the shearing force that's tending to occur in the piece of wood. It's always going to produce the failure on the weak shear plane. So the image at the top shows what happens when the beam is bending. The material on the top is going into compression and it doesn't want to shorten. The material on the bottom is going into tension and it resists being too, too greatly stretched out. And what makes those things work together as a simple beam, as, as a single beam rather, is the capacity of the material to maintain its structural integrity along that shear plane. When that shear stress becomes ex excessive, um, the um, beam no longer functions as a beam because it splits down the neutral axis at each end of the beam. Then it becomes like two beams, and the two beams are always weaker, particularly relative to moment capacity, and they're not as stiff as one beam glued together. Uh, and we had an example of that in the textbook, by the way, where we showed uh, 10 pieces of plexiglass stacked on top of each other. When they weren't glued together, they deflected a tremendous amount, and they were relatively weak. And then when they were glued together, they became much stronger and and much, much stiffer. Okay, so we don't want this kind of failure to occur, and so we need um, to accommodate that. Now, in a previous lecture, we rearranged all these equations so that we got a term of 1 over b times L over h to the first power. And we did that because what we said was, well, b and h are both cross-sectional properties, and normally we would cluster them together, but we began to see patterns in these equations and we pursued those patterns and discovered that uh, the shear stress 
goes as one over the thickness of the beam or the base of the cross section of the beam. The bending stress goes over like one over the base of the cross section. And this fractional deflection also goes like one over B. So what we concluded was that B um, helps, but it's not a very dramatic benefit. We can double the base. We use twice as much material, uh, but we only cut in half the shear force and the bending stress, excuse me, the shear stress and the bending stress and the deflection. On the other hand, when we clustered these things together and clustered L with H, we discovered that the shear stress goes as L over H to the first power. The bending stress goes as L over H squared and the fractional deflection goes as L over H cubed. Now we went through that exercise because we were trying to demonstrate that certain of these phenomena are extremely sensitive to the proportions, which is the length over the depth or the depth over the length, either one. That proportion keeps appearing here with ever increasing sensitivity as we move from shear stress to bending stress to deflection. And that was very interesting as an exercise because it taught us that we can, to a first order, come up with guidelines that are very reliable for spans and more specifically for proportions of certain spanning members. Um, and this is an illustration of why this is so important. This ratio that appears to the cube power for the def fractional deflection is immensely important and it's the underpinnings for what allows us to generate those very simplified design guidelines. Now we went through that and, and now we want to return to not just thinking in a sort of philosophical way and, and not thinking just in terms of these guidelines for proportions, but we'd actually like to be able to size a beam and know that it's going to be have enough bending stress and strength and shear strength to be safe and that it's going to be stiff enough to be serviceable and acceptable to our clients. So we're going to go away from this again and we're going to reformat all our equations again with a different focus. And the new focus is we're going to try and solve for certain parameters that tell us something about what the final product is like. And the final product means what's the depth and thickness of the beam, for example, to span a certain distance under certain loads with a certain stress grade of material. So we have this equation, shear stress is equal to 1.5 times the shear force divided by the area of the cross section. Now, the shear stress capacity is gonna be given, us, given to us by the materials that are available. And the industry that produces those materials are gonna give us allowed stress values that we can design to. So our challenge as designers is to figure out what's the geometry of the beam. And the crucial factor here that we want is A. So what we're going to do is we're going to transport uh, uh, A and F sub V prime so that now we're solving for A being equal to 1.5 times the shear force divided by the shear stress. And then I, for a simple span beam, I've gone in and I've said, well, the maximum shear force is W dead plus W live times L divided by 2. And this gives me an equation to solve for the cross-sectional area. Likewise, in this equation right here, we have F sub B prime is equal to M over S. Again, F sub B prime is going to be expressed as an allowable stress, which the wood industry is going to tell us what that is for the particular species and grade of wood we're using. So our job as designers is to find out what the section modulus needs to be. So we're going to transpose S and FB prime. So now instead of FB prime is equal to M over S, we've got S is equal to M over FB prime. And again, I'm going to put in the value for M for a simple span beam. It's W dead plus W live times L squared over eight. Or we can bring out this one eighth factor to clean it up in the following way. Similarly, we can uh, look at this equation and say, well, delta is going to be prescribed by our rules, such as delta over L 
should um, always be less than 1 over 360. Um, e is going to be prescribed by the people who supply the material. E is the material stiffness. I is the cross-sectional stiffness or the moment of inertia. Um, and we're going to solve for I uh, in this equation and we end up with this and when we further simplify it down we end up with this. So we have the moment of inertia is 5 over 384 uh, times this load factor times LQ over E and now L over delta is taken to be 360 in most cases. This is a number that can be played with because it's not a life safety issue, it's a perceptual issue more than anything else at least in a floor, which is what we're going to look at next. You'll notice here it says 1 half W dead plus W live. The uh, reason for this is in the case of steel we just use W live and that's because steel is a perfectly elastic material that when we put a load on it and then take the load off it goes back to its original shape. Whereas wood is a material that exhibits some creep and we don't want something that deflects too much because over time uh, even under the dead load it will begin to creep and change shape. So one of the ways the wood industry sort of takes that into account is that in addition to the usual W live which is a perceptual thing we also are including this one half of W dead uh, but other than that all the, this equation is exactly what we would use in the case of steel. So these equations down at the bottom here are summarizing uh, our design process and so we're just going to write these summarizing design equations in the following way. A equals 3 quarters of WL over FV prime, S equals 1 eighth of WL squared over FV prime and so forth. So we have those three equations. Now to come back here for rectangular sections a is equal to BH, S is equal to BH squared over 6, I is equal to BH cubed over 12. Now this means that to get A, S, and I we have three vari two variables that we can play with. One is the width of the base of the cross-section the other is the height of the cross-section. Uh, one of the nice things about solid sawn lumber though is uh, one of these variables is already picked for us. When we go design wood joists for a flooring system, we're almost always going to use two bys of some kind. Two by four, two by six, two by eight, two by ten, or at most two by twelve. So B is actually set at 1.5 inches. Uh, this is the finished thickness of a two by uh, that surfaced four sides. Now this 1.5 inches was chosen because beams of that sort would have good deep proportions so they'd work well in terms of stiffness and strength and resisting moments um, but they're still thick enough that they um, won't be laterally unstable and it will be easy for somebody to drive a nail through the decking and actually hit the beam. So this 1.5 was settled on over many, many years of construction and everyone feels comfortable with it at this point. 1.5 is also nice because boards of that thickness can cure fairly quickly. If you use a, a board that's twice that thick where its actual dimensions were 3 inches for example, then it will take four times as long to cure and curing time is a major part of the cost in, in building construction. So we're going to stick for the moment with boards that are one and a half inch actual thickness and then we can gen generate a table like this where we say well okay we know we have uh, two by fours available, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, and two by twelves. We write up the actual dimensions of those things in their finished form. Then we can calculate BH or BH squared over six or BH cubed over twelve and this provides a lookup table for us basically so once we've figured out what area and section modulus and moment of inertia are required we just come into this table and figure out whether it's a 2x6 or 2x8 or 2x10 or 2x12. Okay so we're going to go back to our design equations and what we have here is 
uh, first of all, we, we kind of understand what our ground rules are relative to A, S, and I. Uh, we have a lookup table for those, and these equations are going to allow us to calculate them. So now we need to look at our equations and ask, well, where do we get the information? Well, first of all, we know from our design situation what the span is likely to be. And in this example, we're going to take a span of 16 feet uh, because that's one of the more challenging lengths to get to with solid sawn lumber. And we want to just understand what the limits are of this material. So next thing we're going to look at is loads. And then eventually we'll look at allowed stress designs or the stiffness of the material. So in assessing loads, we're going to start with dead loads and we're going to kind of look at the maximum loads that are likely to occur. So the heaviest floor we've looked at so far is the combination of particle board, uh, 5 sixteenths of an inch thick, um, on top of plywood, which is a half an inch thick. And I've put in the sort of upper limits on the density of particle board and the upper limits on the density of plywood and when I multiply all these numbers out I get that the particle board is 2.34 pounds per square foot uh, and the plywood is 1.46 pounds per square foot and these are numbers that we ran earlier uh, when we talked about loads. Uh, sheetrock for the ceiling, a good upper limit for that for half inch sheetrock is two and a half pounds. It's probably a bit less than that but that's a number we typically take. Then if we say, okay, well, we're kind of looking at the upper end, so let's take 2 by 12 joists, which are going to be the heaviest that we're likely to use, and we're going to put them 16 inches on center because we're going to put them as far apart as possible as limited by the spanning capacity of the decking that we are dealing with in this case. Um, so the effective area distributed load for the joists will be the weight which is the density times the volume uh, divided by the amount of floor that that is associated with. So we're going to take a one foot length. So here we have a one foot length. It's 11.25 inches deep. It's one and a half inches thick. It has a density of 30 pounds a cubic foot. And by the way, to clean up the units, we got cubic feet here and then we got inches, inches and feet. So one of those feet cancels out one of these, and then we have inches squared on, on top of feet squared. So these things in the square brackets, a foot per 12 inches, is just there to convert all the inches to feet. So we have an inch unit here and an inch unit there, and these are the conversion factors that are going to clean those up and turn them into feet. And then, by the way, this one linear foot of joist is supporting decking that's one foot along the length of the joist times 1.33 feet across, which is 16 inches. And when we want to wind out all these numbers, we get an effective distributed area distributed load of 2.64 pounds per square foot. So when I add all these together, 2.34, 1.46, 2.5, and 2.64, I get 8.93 pounds per square foot. It'll be a little less if we have a shallower joist. Um, it might vary slightly if the density of the material varies slightly, but this is a very good number um, that indicates the upper limit of what this load is likely to be. Now in the case of wood, we have one other really weird little thing we have to account for. Um, if you've ever broken something that's made out of wood, you've noticed that um, when you get up to a certain load, it starts making funny noises, cracking, popping sounds. And what's happening is some of the cells are delaminating in the, in the wood and uh, load paths are being redirected in the wood. And so some of the weaker cell connections are, are giving up, but other cell connections may hold in there for a while. So. These telltale signs of imminent failure in the wood uh, can be a really good thing. I worked on a project once where uh, those sounds actually saved the lives of the crew members that were working on the building and actually saved the building also. Um, during construction, people tend to be a little more careless about uh, 
They don't sit there and calculate what all the construction loads are while they're building the building. Instead, they, they might renovate and tear parts out and um, their loads might become excessive and those sounds can be helpful. But they are characteristic of a property of wood, which is that it has creep, so it can change shape over time, but it also gives up slowly. So if you hit it with a very strong stress that doesn't last very long, then you may do almost no damage to it. On the other hand, if you apply that same force and create that same stress and leave it on there for a long time, then the structure is likely to fail at some point in time under that load. So for example, little kids used to do this Olympics of the mind and one of the challenges that they had was to design a balsa wood column that would hold a fairly high load. And so one of the tricks in doing that problem was to make sure that you loaded it as quickly as possible. Now that doesn't mean dropping things on it. You want to set everything gently down so you don't have inertial forces that become excessive. But you want to get the weight on there as fast as possible because it might fail at 25% lower load if you're real slow and casual about getting the load on it. So anyway, those are just uh, sort of talking around this issue, but here's the load factors that we have to apply. Occupancy and live loads, we can allow whatever the stresses that come out of our equations. Snow loads, which are assumed to be of shorter duration, we can actually allow them to go 15% higher because they're only going to be there for a couple of months or less. Uh, in a place like Raleigh, you know, this factor probably could even be higher, but these are approximate numbers which are supported by code decisions. <clears throat> Um, wind and earthquake, or which are very short duration, can go up 1.6. But we're designing a floor, and so we have to worry about occupancy load and dead load. And the interesting thing is this dead load says we actually either have to drive our stresses down. We can't allow our stresses to go beyond 90% of the allowed stress value. Or the other way of working it is we can just say, well, whatever dead load we got, we're going to jack that dead load up by 1 over 0 0.9 um, as a way of accounting for it. Because it's real hard to account for it in any other way because we have a certain stress coming out of dead load and another stress coming out of live load and we don't know how to mix those together. They're like apples and oranges. But what we can do is we can mix together the normal live load and a slightly exaggerated dead load to account for this long-term load condition. So before we calculated 8.93 pounds per square foot as a kind of upper limit of the load that we're going to have distributed on this floor due to the joist and the decking and the sheetrock and so forth. Um, and we're going to divide that by 0.9 in order to jack up the, the value of the dead load to account for the fact that the dead load is more disturbing because it's a longer term load. So when we divide that by 0.9, we get 9.9 .9 pounds and we're going to round that up to 10 pounds a square foot. And by the way, this 10 pounds a square foot is almost universally accepted as the number we're going to go with when we start the design of any kind of wood structure of this sort. Uh, if we're just designing a floor, for example, that will be the number that we pick. So in summary, this leaves us with the following floor loads. P dead equals 10 pounds a square foot, P live equals 40 pounds a square foot on the main floor, or that would be 30 pounds a square foot on secondary floors. And now we're going to figure out, this is a pressure in pounds per square foot, and we want to convert that to uh, a W in pounds per foot. So we're going to take P dead, which is 10 pounds a square foot. We're going to multiply the space times the spacing, which is 16 inches. So this is our classic W equals PS formula that we learned earlier. And now we want to convert inches to feet. So we multiply by this term, one foot per 12 inches, and we get 13.33 pounds per foot. For the live load, we have 40 pounds a square foot times the spacing with the conversion factor, and we end up with uh, 53.33 pounds per square foot.
So we can go back now and we can put in the sum of those two. Um, 53.33 and 13.33 comes out to 66.67. The same number goes here. A somewhat reduced number goes there because it's only half of the dead load. Okay, so now we have all our loads. We know what the length is. We have a table for a lookup table for the area and section modulus and moment of inertia. Section modulus being the cross-sectional strength in resisting internal moment and moment of inertia being the cross-sectional stiffness of the, of, the, uh, of the beam. So now all we need are some allowed stresses, F sub V prime, S sub B prime, and, an, and a stiffness E. Now, when you go into this table, here this shows species and commercial grade, size classification, bending stress, F sub B, and again, these are design values or allowed stress in the allowed stress design. So you have to design your beam so it has that much bending stress or less, that much shear stress or less. And here we have a stiffness E for performing the calculations. And we have a stiffness E, by the way, E minimum, which for a floor like this where we have repetitive members, we have a bunch of different members contributing to the stiffness of the floor. Uh, so we're going to perform our calculations based on this average stiffness. Over here we have select structural. Very difficult to find anywhere these days. Number one, you can buy it. They used to carry it in Lowe's. And in fact, there used to be about 10 of these grades. And I could go to the lumber yard and pick out any ones I wanted. We've used up all our old growth wood. Many of those grades of wood we don't even bother to handle anymore. Um, even number one, as little as 25 years ago, I, ought to be, I could go to Lowe's or any other uh, store of that type, Home Depot, and they'd have some number one and some number two. It's been a very long time since I've seen a number one grade of material in Lowe's. What they almost always sell are two things. Number two, or stud grade. And of course, we're not designing a floor out of studs. These are studs are two by fours typically. Um, sometimes you can buy two by six studs, but typically you cut them out of uh, two by six members that are either number two or number three. So our options, just like we have a thickness of 1.5 inches, which is kind of nice because it makes our life simple. <coughs> we don't have to account for a lot of different possibilities. We likewise don't have to count for a lot of different possibilities because number two is going to be what we tend to find available. By the way, you'll see things like Eastern Hemlock, Tamarack, Eastern Softwoods, Eastern White Pine. <coughs> I have no idea what Eastern Softwoods even means, but there's some funding, some agency here that's the grading agency. And they basically will tell us we're going to sell you this kind of wood and we have stress graded it and therefore we can tell you that you're going to have a safe building if you work with our allowed stress methods. Um, here's something where they have a mixture of hemlock and fir and whatever this agency is they figure out what's a safe value to give you for these things. Um, <clears throat> here's Douglas fir larch and spruce pine fir south. So I've just picked a sampling. There's a whole bunch of these listed in the national design standard for uh, wood construction. Um, I picked three here that are kind of weak. This is a fairly low bending stress. Um, the shear stress here, this is the lowest one I see. This is the lowest stiffness value. Uh, hemlock fir has a much higher value of bending stress, not a whole lot better in shear stress, although for wood joists, which are relatively lightly loaded, uh, the shear will not govern, as we will see shortly. Shear is going to govern wherever you have cumulative loads, like a header over a garage door. It's a long span with maybe one or two floors that's supporting up above, plus a roof. Then the loads get large, and then shear stress becomes a more significant concern. 
So here we have 575, 575, 575, 580, and here is Douglas fir larch, which is 900 and 180. So it has the highest values everywhere here. And then we have spruce pine fir, which is a little further down the list. And so we're going to do this problem <clears throat> using, so I'm going to delete this because we're going to be using Douglas fir larch. So remember these numbers, 900, 180, and 6, 1.6 million. We're going to go here and I have 180 for the shear stress, 900 for the bending stress, and 1.6 million pounds per square inch for the stiffness. So <clears throat> here are the equations that we had earlier. Um, for A required, the required cross-sectional stiffness strength rather relative to moments and the required cross-sectional stiffness, which is the moment of inertia I. So we go plug in all these numbers. So W dead plus W live, we said was 66.67. We said we're going to use a 16 foot beam. And uh, the equation was these two constants, three over four. And then F sub V is going to be 180 inches squared. That's this number here. That's the allowed stress. And they're saying if you design to that stress, you're going to have a margin of safety your building's going to be good and solid and really safe. And so you can go with whatever required area you come up with. Now I want you to notice something here. Um, we're trying to con convert all the units to be as consistent as possible. So we got an inches squared down in the denominator. We're going to multiply by inches squared in the denominator to clean up this and get rid of that inches squared to keep the logic of this sensible mathematically, we also have to multiply the numerator of this whole thing by inch squared. So this inch squared annihilates that one, that pound annihilates that one, and uh, we end up in consistent units. This feet, by the way, cancels that feet, and we end up with 4.44 inches squared. Now the minimum two by that works at 16 inches on center for this 16 foot span under this particular set of loads of dead load of 10 pounds a square foot and live load of 40 pounds a square foot. The lightest member that works is a two by four, which has a cross sectional area of 5.25 inches squared, which is greater than what's required, which is 4.44 inches squared. We got that from right there. Now we're going to go through and we're going to say S required is given by this expression here, which we had earlier. So we plug in our loads. We, for L, we put in 16, so we have 16 feet squared. Keep in mind, write that 16 feet squared with parentheses around it, or square the 16 and square the feet so that you don't lose some kind of a, a factor there that you need. Again, we're going to clean up the units, inches squared to get rid of that, which requires an inches squared in the numerator. And then we have one extra foot in the numerator. So we're going to convert 12 inches per foot uh, to get everything in terms of inches. So we end up with inches cubed, which is what we expect because it's one half times the base times the height squared, excuse me, one sixth of the base times the height squared. So base times height squared is inches times inches squared, which gives us inches cubed. So the minimum two by that works for this particular concern of cross-sectional strength and resisting moment is a two by 12. S for two by 12 is 31.64. We just calculated that the required value is 2.844. So a two by 12 works for bending strength. Now, I'm going to come back to the rest of this in a moment, but I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this calculation for the required cross-sectional stiffness or moment of inertia. This is the equation that we saved from earlier. We go plug in one half of 13.33 and then we have the 53.33 from the live 
And now for L cubed, we're going to put 16 feet. And again, we put it under the parentheses to make sure that we cube both of those. And it won't hurt you to just say 16 cubed times feet cubed to be emphatic and make sure you keep track of everything properly. Again, we're going to clean up this inches squared in the very bottom of this expression by multiplying this denominator right here by inches squared. To keep it legitimate, we have to multiply the numerator by inches squared. And then we got a bunch of two extra units of feet up above that we want to clean up. So we're going to multiply by 12 inches per foot and 12 inches per foot. And we come up with this value of 103.68. The minimum 2 by that works at 16 inches on center relative to this deflection issue is also a 2 by 12. The uh, moment of inertia for a 2 by 12 is 177.98 inches to the fourth. Note this inches to the fourth. If you run these numbers and you don't get inches to the fourth, it probably means you drop something somewhere because that's a very odd uh, unit and it has to be inches to the fourth. So I required was 103.68. So clearly 177.98 is a lot more than 103.68. So we're a little over designed right here um, for moment strength. We're way over designed for stiffness. The interesting thing is we got two by 12 for strength, two by 12 for stiffness, and two by four for shear. So what this tells us is that for lightly loaded situations like floor joist, shear is not a significant problem. It's going to be some other load condition or span condition where shear is important. Okay, now two by twelves tend to be about twice as expensive as a two by ten. Um, and they tend to be more rare and it tends to be harder to get decent grade 2x12s just because we've used up so much of our wood supply. So another thing is that in designing a floor of a house, we almost always set the depth of the floor beams based on the longest span. And then consistent with this whole idea of platform construction where the floor is a flat uh, platform between floors of the building. Um, we don't vary the depth of the, of the joist across the floor. So it becomes pretty important that we not let the longest span situation drive us to very deep beams, which means we're going to be using expensive beams everywhere in this house because of this one situation here. So one of the things we're going to look at is we're going to ask the question, if we went to the next shallower beam, which is a 2 by 10, what spacing would we have to put it on in order to satisfy, for example, this issue of moment capacity? So we're going to say, OK, um, we calculated a certain S that was required at 16 inch spacing. So at a 16 inch spacing, that was the section modulus that we needed. What if we come along and we substitute in uh, this section modulus right here, which is 21.39 inches cubed for a 2 by 10. So I've said a 2 by 10 has this section modulus. That was the required section modulus. So if we use more 2 by 10s and we put them closer together, then we should produce a satisfactory floor. So now when I divide the section modulus of a 2 by 10 by the section modulus that was required at the 16 inch spacing, I get a new spacing that's required for this 2 by 10. And that new spacing calculates to be a 12.04 inch spacing. We have to space it at that or less. And we're not going to be out on the field calculating down to 0.04 inches. And in fact, the plywood or you know, the plywood and the particle board are both going to be in 96 inch wide pieces that span across these joists. So whatever joist spacing we're going to use is going to be some integer divider of 96 inches. In this case, it's 96 over 8, which is 12 inches. So what we're saying is with 2 by 10s at a 12 inch spacing, we can do uh, a satisfactory job and then we don't have to buy 
two by twelves at 16 inches on center, which will be more expensive, not only for that room, the spanning 16 feet, but for every other room where the two by 12 will end up being pretty drastically oversized for the shorter spans. So in this case, we'd probably use uh, two by tens space one foot apart. We still have to check this deflection issue though. So we're going to do the same kind of calculation here. We're going to say there's some new spacing for the two by 10, which is the moment of inertia for the two by 10 divided by the required moment of inertia for the 16 foot spacing times 16 inches. So in other words, we are moving these closer together. Um, but it turns out the two by 10 was almost adequate by itself. And in fact, the two by 12 was way over designed. So we could almost get away with a 16 inch spacing, but it has to be 15.27 inches. But this becomes a sort of an irrelevant calculation because clearly this is what governs. We had to move these all the way down to 12 inches on center to account for moment capacity. So in the end, what we're going to do in this building, if we have this stress grade and we have this species of lumber, is we're going to put two by tens at 12 inches on center for the 16 foot space. And then they're going to work really well at 16 inches center on center for the shorter spaces in the building. So this is a summary, by the way, of four different species and stress grades. In every case, it's a different species because we've chosen to go with number two, number two, Douglas fir larch, number two, hemlock fir, number two, spruce pine fir south, and number two, eastern white pine. And I chose these to cover the spectrum from the very best, which is an F sub B of 900 pounds per square inch as the design stress under bending all the way down to 575. And you'll notice, by the way, there's a kind of a progression. If we order these according to bending stress, generally the shear stress goes more or less that way and the stiffness goes more or less that way. So here are the numbers we just got. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, 4.44 square inches for the area, 28.44 inches cubed for the uh, cross-sectional strength and bending, and 103.68 uh, for the cross-sectional stiffness to avoid excessive deflection. Now, we then go through and we put in the appropriate numbers for these other stress grades and something interesting happens here. Uh, what it says is for number two spruce pine fir, we need a section modulus at six inches, 16 inches on center of 33.03. .03, and it itself is only 31.64. So I've highlighted these cells in yellow to say we don't even have a solution that works at a 16 foot span at 16 inches on center. So we're actually going to either have to space these two by 12s closer together, or we're going to have to pick two by 10s and space them even closer together. So for example, to satisfy this strength issue, we'd have to space them at um, two by 10s at 10.36. And I think the next smaller number below that, that's a subdivider of 96 would be 9.6 inches. Um, maybe you can get a contractor that will actually bother doing that. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> we have an even worse problem with Eastern white pine, uh, which requires a section modulus of 44.5 inches cubed to be, have adequate moment strength at 16 inches on center. So this is going to have to be radically closer together to make two by 12s work. Now this raises an interesting philosophical point. Um, when you go to Lowe's, they tell you there's a bunch of two by 10s and two by 12s and they'll say number two. And there are very few contractors that even ask what is, what is the species? 
So most of the time they're going to just go buy some some material that they think is going to work at that span and I hope they're pretty conscientious about it but this has become such a commodity driven issue that most people don't think about it in these fine engineering terms anymore. They basically say well you know two by tens can span a certain distance at 16 inches on center that's what we're going to go grab. As you can see though there's a lot of difference between uh, this uh, 28.44 for the Douglas fir larch and this 44.52 for eastern white pine. So it's pretty important that your your builder be sensitive to this. How likely that is to happen though is a question for debate. Um, okay so one other sort of comment I want to make. Um, all these methods that we have gone through for sizing solid sawn wood beams, all the mathematics applies perfectly to solid other materials like glue lamb beams or even laminated veneer lumber beams. We're not going to go through that in this particular set of videos. Um, it is covered in the book. It also uh, is slightly different in one regard. When we go doing solid sawn beams, we got this nice simple 10 pounds a square foot, which is what we're designing to. And uh, that's a very reliable number and a very simple number. In the case of laminated veneer, excuse me, in the case of glue lamb beams, these glue lamb beams can become much, much larger. They'll span longer distances, they'll be much deeper, they'll be much thicker, and the self weight associated with them can be fairly variable depending upon the span that's involved. So what we would do in that case is we'd use a spreadsheet that uh, starts off by saying, well, let's assume the self weight of the beam is something or other, maybe even zero, we do an iteration, we update the beam, we do another iteration, update the beam. So we have a bit more accurate calculation for the dead load associated with the self weight of the beam. In the case of sawn lumber, the dead weight is such an incredibly small part of it and doesn't vary tremendously between say a 2x8 and a 2x10 and a 2x12. Um, the variation there is very small and so we tend not to account for it. We just put in a dead load that represents the heaviest beam that we're likely to have there, which in our case was a 2x12. Um, but other than that difference of how we account for the self weight of the beam itself, the method for solving or designing a glue lamb beam will be essentially the same as what we did here. The glue lamb folks will give you a set of allowed stresses for various types of beams and you can size it this way. Uh, more than likely, of course, they're going to size it for you, but you can do a preliminary sizing yourself uh, starting with a simple spreadsheet like that. So that concludes the third in a series of videos. This is from Chapter 6, Section 2, Subsection 2, uh, and there's a C indicating that this is the third in this series of videos focusing on sizing sawn wood beams. And again, I remind you, all this is based on the allowed stress design and not the load and resistance factor design.